Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're glad to have you with us for today's presentation featuring experts Jeremy Linden, Senior Director, Product Management of Assimily, and Greg Scott, Vice President, Information Technology of Renovo. Jeremy and Greg will show you how to build efficiency into your procurement process by ensuring that you purchase devices without major cybersecurity liabilities and configure them securely. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Assimily. Assimily helps healthcare providers maximize device uptime and value from their devices. Assimily's IOMT risk remediation platform holistically secures the mission critical healthcare devices that deliver safe and reliable care. To achieve its objectives, Assimily integrates with different data sources, which when appended with Assimily's research, provides actionable insights to the provider. For more information, please visit assimily.com. A few announcements before we get started. Don't miss our 20th anniversary celebration at MD Expo in Atlanta on April 11th through the 13th this year. MD Expo strives to provide healthcare technology management professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. You can find all the details and registration at mdexposhow.com. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win a Webinar Wednesday shirt by answering the following question. The Assembly Headquarters is located in which city and state? You can find the answer by visiting our sponsor's website and you can use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit your answer. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We'll wrap up today with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions at any time by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speakers today are Jeremy Linden and Greg Scott. Jeremy, you may begin whenever you are ready. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, the topic today is around maximizing the investment in your uh, IOMT or Internet of Medical Things devices. Um, and we're going to talk about that from, you know, kind of a couple different angles today. So first I'll introduce uh, myself um, and, and my, uh, my co-panelist will also introduce himself. So I run product management at Assimily. Um, we are a full spectrum asset management and cybersecurity solution for IOMT devices or connected medical devices. Um, we you know, help from the beginning to the end. So from pre-procurement risk assessments and configuration guidance, hardening guides, all the way through to operations, vulnerability management, detecting and remediating uh, network anomalies um, and, and potential threats, um, all the way through to capacity planning, um, you know, decommissioning devices um, at, the, at the end. Um, so that's, that's a simile and, and about me, um, I have over 15 years in the cybersecurity industry um, in a few different roles from threat analyst to engineer to being uh, in product management for the last 10 years or so. Um, I have experience across uh, endpoint as well as network, both of which um, we leverage uh, here at Assimily. Um, Greg, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Jeremy. So my name is Greg Scott. Uh, I'm as vice president for Renovo Solutions, uh, I oversee a lot of our infrastructure, our development, our IT security internally, and then I also work with customers externally to consult with them around medical device security specifically as part of our medical device managed services, uh, cybersecurity managed services offering. Um, my background actually started in biomed, so I've been a biomed, I've worked on medical devices, worked on imaging equipment, uh, got involved in basically information systems surrounding medical devices as things got more and more connected. Uh, before cybersecurity was the was the buzzword, it was HIPAA, uh, it was it was just viruses and, and conflicker and things like that. And uh, so I've seen this kind of morph and change over the years. Uh, and my focus is to kind of address that and help Renovo Solutions address that for our customers. 
So, you know, about, about Assimily, so we were founded in 2017. Uh, we're a venture-backed startup. Um, we've received, you know, multiple awards from being a Gartner cool vendor to being recognized in the class report. Uh, we've recently won a couple awards from IoT Evolution World. Um, we are a full, fully healthcare focused. Healthcare is all we do, um, and we are deployed to you know thousands of sites um, in in the U.S. Um, and we partner uh, with Renovo um, to to you know, offer a managed service that Renovo offers that's built on top of uh, Assimilies technology. So you have the best of breed HTM software platform uh, as as well as the best people to to run it. Greg, you want to talk a bit about Renovo? Yeah, so we were founded in 2009. Um, we are basically an independent service organization focused in healthcare and supporting the medical device landscape as well as life science landscape. Uh, we've received multiple awards actually in the topic and an area of cybersecurity uh, from both ECRI and Amy. And you know, when we really were trying to address a a gap in our program around how we handle this, this continuous evolving threat um, that we'll talk about more today. Uh, you know, really we, we found that Assimily was the right partner in this space, uh, going beyond just uh, asset identification, really into true risk management, uh, the methodology, the tooling, and really the why behind the product uh, is what made, me, wait, made us uh, select Assimily. Um, which I think we'll kind of talk through some of those challenges uh, today. Um, but really, you know, if coming from a biomed's perspective, you know, we're really looking at what tools give our our staff uh, the best leg up uh, and make their jobs the easiest. And you know, Assembly is the partner that does that for us. So uh, thank you for letting me join you today, and I'll let you get started. Great. So, so first, uh, you know, the the first sort of angle here is really around addressing security around, you know, during the procurement process, and and you know why you should do it, and and what the best way is to actually create a program to do this in an effective way. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about just the security landscape around connected medical devices because it's always changing, um, and really, IOMT devices are becoming a pretty significant part of an organization's attack surface, you know, with the average hospital room having, you know, a dozen or so connected devices, almost all of those devices are in some way vulnerable. It's sort of just the, the inherent nature of these devices. And unfortunately, the volume of threats, as many of you probably know, really just keeps increasing. Um, and, and unfortunately, many of these devices really are still pretty insecure. So you have a, a, you know, really a confluence of, you know, very, very high impact um, with, with a, a pretty significant tide of risk. And, and that always, um, you know, that, that always can cause issues. So, so really, what are the challenges? Uh, why is this a hard problem? Well, um, there's a bunch of reasons, many of which a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, but, but just to cover some of them, the, the ecosystem here is extremely complex. There are a lot of vendors. Um, there's a, a lot of heterogeneous software platforms. Um, the devices are, you know, often, you know, the person who supports them is different than the person who operates them, um, often tied, tied to service contracts. So, you know, in many ways, they're not like typical software type products. Um, in another way, in another way that they're not similar is that Rarely, you know, often you can't really patch these devices. Um, it might actually void the warranty to apply a patch if one isn't available for the manufacturer. And a lot of these manufacturers, um, unfortunately, are really not providing, you know, a, a what I would say is a sufficient amount of of updating, and you know, through the device's reasonable service uh, window operation window. And then, you know, many of these devices are still running extremely old systems um, like Windows 7, Windows XP, or even earlier. You know, these devices sit around for a very long time. You know, most organizations, understandably, are pretty loath to try to replace some of these devices that are very expensive simply because the software that's running on them is getting old. 
Um, and, and that's totally understandable. That's something that we, you know, at Assimile work with all the time, right? And it's something that you have to be aware of if you're in this, if you're operating in this industry and you have to try to figure out ways um, to allow organizations to extend the lifetime of the software because that really shouldn't be the long pole in the tent for, for having a device um, not be able to be used anymore, given given the complexity and the expense of, of the physical devices themselves. Um, there's also just like a lack of software stack um, in terms of you know how to inventory these devices, how to actually assess them for risk. For a lot of reasons, traditional security solutions that rely on agents running on the devices or traditional vulnerability management products that rely on scanning these devices, they just don't work for these types of devices that can't run agents. They often don't have don't respond well to scans. They could crash um, while they're deployed in the patient care environment, which is obviously bad. Um, so, so really you need specialized tools. Uh, we, we see a lot of organizations that are try that try to solve this problem by just using um, you know your typical security stack that you apply to servers and endpoints. And you know for a lot of reasons it just doesn't work. Um, and then because of that a lot of these organizations just don't know what they have. And if you don't know what you have, it's very, very challenging to secure it um, because you know the, the, the most risky asset is one that you didn't that you don't even know exists and you don't even understand the risks that that, they, that exist there. And then a lot of these protocols are not the typical standard protocols that like a lot of these off-the-shelf solutions um, for security understand, right? They're proprietary. Um, they're built specifically for these devices. They're not open standards. Um, they operate in, you know, unique and esoteric ways that really do require special knowledge to understand. So, so now that I've painted that that potentially, you know, concerning landscape, I, I want to talk about what, you know, what the challenge is uh, of of procurement security. But first, I want to talk about why it makes sense to solve this problem during procurement. Simply put, the easiest security issue to fix is one that you never created. Um, and, and, and sometimes with a lot of these devices, you really do have the option to do that, whether that's through buying a different device or whether that's through configuring devices in a different way. Um, there are lots of options that organizations have now to really, you know, proactively take on these risks and, and, and sort of pre-mitigate them. Um, why doesn't, you know, in, in addition to the, the time savings um, from, from doing it proactively as opposed to reactively, sometimes the risk is just very high, right? Too high to be effectively mitigated and uh, deploying the device at all could, cause, could really be an, 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 in a, just a, an unacceptable security liability in the first place. And, even if sounding, even and, and then if, if you know, still reactively solving this problem sounds like a good idea. Remember that that attackers can move quickly, and if you deploy a device even for a few days that has massive blind spots, with the way a lot of these attacks happen in an automated fashion, those blind spots can and do get discovered in a lot faster time frame than you'd think. Um, and then lastly, procurement is. A, a gate that you can apply, right? Every device has to go through procurement. So if you really want to set a rule that all your devices uh, have to perform a risk assessment, um, this is a good place to do it because every device, of course, really has to go through procurement as the first step. And so it's a way to ensure that this actually gets done because you have to get it done before you actually can, can get the device. And, and, and for some of the reasons why you might want to be performing these risk assessments, there are some important regulatory uh, considerations, um, some rules that have been promulgated from uh, OCR in the, depart in the HHS department. Um, so here is sort of an ex excerpt from the, the, the relevant rule. So organizations must conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risk uh, and vulnerabilities to the you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of you know, the PHI that's held by the organization. Um, and it must, uh, the scope of this must include basically anything that could be a threat um, to that CIA triad that we'll talk about a bit later um, to these, uh, to, for, for these devices, right? So, so 
you know, we, we have a standard regulatory standard now that we actually, that you do have to perform um, a risk assessment. Um, but there are some, some you know, ambiguities here and, and Greg's gonna talk about that next. Yep, so, you know, not only, I think, does, does, do, the, do the organizations have these mandates, um, but, you know, if we talk about HTM specifically and being involved in the device acquisition, um, Joint Commission basically just came out recently and said, hey, uh, cybersecurity is not just IT's responsibility. And then DNV has a selection criteria around procuring devices and you have to have a process. Um, unfortunately, all of these kind of mandates and these regulations don't truly provide guidance on how to do it. Uh, and so the, I feel like there's a bit of uh, uncertainty in this space of, okay, we know we have this problem. Uh, we just heard about how medical devices can be hacked and there's, there's all these risks out there. Uh, we have now these mandates to do something about it, but who's responsible? Is it HTM? Is it the security team? Is it risk management? Um, you know, risk management's typically looking at uh, compliance and, you know, reducing the risk. HDM's looking at support, IT's looking at security and, and stopping things. And ultimately, you know, when there's, there's not specialized tools or specialized processes for this, uh, scaling becomes very difficult. And, you know, the, this space, uh, we've seen a lot of medical devices become more and more connected, which is, you know, contributing to this issue. But the more connected a hospital system ha uh, becomes, the more difficult this problem gets is to solve because uh, this is just going to, you know, be an ever increasing thing. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, we're just buying standalone devices. Now almost everything's got a connection to it. So we really have to get in front of that. And right now I feel like we're, we're scrambling a bit. Um, so so what, are, what specifically doesn't work? Um, go on to the next slide. There we go. Um, so what we what we see happening a lot are questionnaires. Uh, ourselves, we've we've done the questionnaire dance. Um, this is how the MDS2 form actually got started, is because everybody was trying to ask the vendors, okay, well, what are you doing? What can we do? Um, the MDS2, the Manufacturer's Disclosure Statement for Medical Device Security, was was really to to address that. Well, uh, we've exceeded that, and so a lot of people are uh, creating these more and more complex questionnaires. Unfortunately, this puts the the reliance on the vendors. Um, the MDS2 is voluntary. Uh, filling out these forms, you know, obviously is somewhat voluntary. Now, being in the driver's seat of the purchase, you can can you know obviously have influence at the table. Uh, hey, we're not going to buy this if you don't complete this form. Um, but the, the bigger question is, okay, if they do complete the form, what are you going to do with it? You know, you have a scoring rubric, you assess risk, and you find out that yes, this thing is really complex and we can't do anything about it, it has a bunch of risk. If there's not a process behind that, uh, unfortunately, you're, you're kind of left with a lot of answers, a lot of detail, um, but unless you have really the context of how that device is gonna be used, uh, it really will, probably will leave you asking for more. Um, and you know, I should note that a lot of, even the, the software bill of materials, the MDS2s, they will tell you how a device could be constructed, how the device, the data that it could contain and how it could be connected, but that may differ from how it actually gets installed. So, you know, even when you have questionnaires completed, uh, the way it gets installed in your environment and the controls that you, your organization has to protect it or maybe the lack of controls to protect it uh, could, could greatly affect what that risk looks like in your space. So. A lot of times this relies, or this leaves us relying on segmentation or a boil the ocean type approach where we basically say, okay, all of these devices are bad and we have to limit the damage. So that's very challenging. That, that places a lot of burden on the network security team. It also can affect the implementation of that device and the supportability. So the more complex uh, you know, we make the network in order to, to protect the world, um, the more difficult it becomes to actually use these devices uh, for what they're intended for, as well as then support them. And so there's, there's obviously a balancing act with security um, in, in kind of trying to balance these, these approaches. 
So uh, if we go to the next slide, really, you know, the question is, what do we need to consider uh, in the procurement process when we're talking about risk? Uh, you know, I think in the HTM space that we're used to uh, contract costs and supportability and life, uh, the lifespan of an equipment from, from, from a dollars and, and usability standpoint, but what about actual cybersecurity risk? So we need to focus on the, or start really with the CIA triad that Jeremy mentioned earlier. And uh, this isn't about spies, this is about the confidentiality, availability, and integrity uh, of data on that device. So things to be thinking about, you know, what kind of information is gonna be stored? Who's gonna have access to it? Who's it shared with? How is it going to be transmitted? Um, there's been several breaches simply because of, you know, basically this data was not housed just on the device, but it was also shared with other other parties, whether that's the OEMs, third parties, um, intentionally or unintentionally. So, you know, where's your data going uh, once you get this system? Is it going to be stored just on this device? Uh, and will somebody have access to it or potentially have access to it that maybe shouldn't? Um, data itself is now a valuable commodity. The comp you know, we're talking about patient records and and there's, there's a high demand for patient information uh, because a lot of times we can't change our patient information. So this becomes, this becomes a, a high target to hackers. Then you gotta look at the availability. So the more connected these systems, really the more important their availability is. Um, if they perform a critical function to the organization, uh, you have to really think about you know, how, how do we support this function or the service line of the organization if this system goes down um, and then integrity so basically you know the data itself how do we know it's accurate you know biomeds are are, are really uh, designed to think about calibration and you know the heart rate you know is 90 here the heart rate's 90 here um, but beyond just the simulator and the patient monitor where's the data going from there and how are we validating that it maintains that integrity um, so these are all all key things that uh, you really have to ask um, as you're looking at these systems. You know, really, what's what's the data going to uh, going to be like when we get this device? So uh, the next slide, we we kind of talk about what to consider uh, as you're thinking through these things. So if it has information, if it's going to be connected, think about what software this device runs. You know specifically is, is the are you buying a device that has outdated operating system um, a lot of vendors still sell new devices that are already unsupported from the from an operating system standpoint uh, not just picking on windows uh, but we see this with linux we see this with unix uh, really it's it's across the board um, and you know a lot of these vendors their intention is the clinical aspect or you know their focus is on the clinical performance maybe not the security and so um, vulnerable software may be a byproduct unintentionally. Um, does it, and you know, so you can ask, well, do you have any kind of, any way to mitigate that risk? Uh, obviously it's designed a certain way for patient safety, but what about actual cybersecurity safety? Um, if there is a breach, again, what impact does that have? So kind of going back to the CIA triad um, and, and this concept of blast radius, what are we affecting if this device gets breached? Um, talking data, are we talking workflow? Um, you know, a lot of times one device could potentially lead to, you know, crippling the whole organization. Um, you know, if, if that's the device that becomes the pivot point for an attack, uh, or maybe that device is really critical to a key process and now you're, you're turning away patients because you can't, can't do certain studies with them. Um, and then a lot of times, despite, you know, some of the kind of the inherent risk, the configuration itself can be changed to limit the impact of that. Not all vendors allow that though. And so one of the questions to ask up front is, you know, what can you do? Um, again, this information is available in various forms, uh, but, and you, and you kind of have to be familiar with um, how the device operates and how it's gonna work, but the configuration of it can, can highly impact, again, how it's installed in your environment uh, and what risk that brings to your organization. So things that you can ask um, ask your vendors, you know, on the basically, do they do they have a security policy? You know, are they thinking security? 
uh, we see more and more vendors kind of go down this path. Uh, you know, they have a disclosure process, uh, they have a learning process, but you know, what is their actual security policy when it comes to these devices? Are they only focused on patient safety or do they, do they get involved in incident response and security incidents? Um, you know, I think we take for granted sometimes that, hey, you know, if it breaks, we call the OEM. What happens if it gets hacked? Is the OEM going to be able to respond and help you? Um, you know, when it comes to disaster recovery and business continuity, usually HTM is kind of the catch-all, like, oh, well, we'll just call HTM. Well, what about the vendor? Um, how are we going to bring these devices back up should we get an attack? Um, you know, it's one thing to have a single device fail, but how, how can you as a vendor support all these devices? So if we lost all our infusion pumps, all our CTs, um, and, and the same looking outside the organization, if, there's a, if there was a coordinated event that maybe impacted multiple sites, is the vendor prepared to handle that? Um, and if so, what, what is their plan? What is the response? Um, there's several other things they could be doing internally, uh, whether it's risk assessments of their devices, there's third parties that actually will do risk assessments for the OEMs. Uh, the OEMs can do this internally. Uh, they should have controls built into the devices, um, but basically start asking them questions. You know, How are you securing these devices and what's your security posture um, in general? So um, next slide, we talk about some red flags and things that okay, based on those answers, you may be a little wary uh, and, and uh, concerned about. So, you know, maybe the manufacturer hasn't been, a long, been around for a long time. Uh, they, if they're new, this could be both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, maybe they don't have experience in breach situations. Maybe they don't have a robust security platform because, you know, it's a uh, get to market strategy and security is unfortunately second sometimes. Um, other vendor, you know, there's, there's good vendors and bad vendors. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing, but something that you need to, to definitely, uh, be aware of and look into, um, if they don't have any history of releasing patches, you know, some, some OEMs for certain products say, you know, patch it, patch at your own risk. Others say we will validate patches and they have a very formal process. Um, if they're very wishy-washy or there's no history, there's no evidence that there's been patching or this isn't a concern, uh, definitely definitely be concerned. Um, there are information sharing organizations out there, ISOs like uh, HISAC that help kind of connect the consumer or in this case the hospital to the OEMs and share information about both you know, uh, issues within medical device space but also in the cybersecurity space. Um, and if they're not a member of that, if they're not part of a sharing group, uh, that can be a red flag. Um, obviously, there are CFR requirements for uh, reporting corrections when it comes to patient safety. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but there's also other groups like CISA that uh, get into advisories uh, for cybersecurity specifically. And so um, their familiarity with that will tell you a lot about their security posture. Um, and then I want to mention CVEs uh, and basically um, their common vulnerability and exploits. There's a national database, a uh, national vulnerability database that really tries to track all of the vulnerabilities for all things. Um, definitely research the vendor, research the, the model and find out, okay, well, what kind of um, vulnerabilities has, has, have been exposed or been discovered from this, this vendor in the past? Um, and those sorts of things will tell you a lot about the, their areas of intention, basically, when focusing on cybersecurity. So next slide, we'll talk about some information that you should get from the vendor. Uh, obviously, the most recent MDS2 helps a lot. Um, and we say this because there's several versions of MDS2. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, this was, this was, the MDS2 actually goes a, a long way back. Um, and it was designed to help collect information from the OEMs, make it easy for OEMs to you know, respond to all the different customers, all the different hospitals. But there are different versions and they've, they've changed over the years. So starting in 2004, there was a version, 2009 and so on. Uh, the latest is actually 2019 version and it has the most detailed information about the device um, specific around cybersecurity needs. So 
one of the great things about Assembly is they basically ingest this for you um, and actually parse this as part of their risk assessment process. So, you know, it's one thing for us to read a MDS-2 and say, oh, okay, well, this is, you know, this response seems bad. Um, but uh, Assembly does a great job of basically taking that data and saying, okay, well, this is what it actually means as far as the risk posture of this device and, and how we rank it uh, in its relation to, to use. You know, certain things matter more depending on how a device is used. So again, that context helps uh, tremendously there. Um, there's a big push for software bill of materials. You know, if you can ask for this, uh, this is great. Uh, so vendors are starting to produce this. Um, but again, you can easily go down a down a rabbit hole into the software dependency world. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with Log4j, hopefully. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, um, you should do some research. But essentially what I'm what I'm getting at there is there, there's vulnerability in a very uh, tough to find dependency in a product that you may be able to discover in a software bill of material, uh, but generally was overlooked uh, or would be overlooked because Java is used in, in, uh, in a ton of products out in the world. And so it's one thing to get that software bill of material, but it's another thing to actually parse it and, and try to address the risk. Um, but if you can get those from the vendor, definitely ask for it. And then, you know, of course, any kind of vulnerability assessments. Um, basically taking what you should do um, to address those risks. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the onus may be on you to mitigate those risks. So what are those plans for securing the device that can be shared with you as a customer? Um, when you're looking at devices that are that are under contract, obviously new devices usually come with a warranty. There's service contracts that are attached to those. Um, Again, you're in the driver's seat you know, as far as being the, the purchasers. Um, so I suggest building language around the security responsibilities. Uh, a lot of times we see the OEMs uh, refer to customer responsibilities. Um, and you know, there's, there's kind of a reason for that. Uh, obviously, there's certain things that are outside of the control of the OEM. But it does really need to be a shared responsibility, and so I think it's it's key that you have the right people at the table discussing whose responsibility security really is for the different elements, whether it's patching, incident response, um, the data, as we talked earlier, um, but really defining that up front. So identify what your responsibilities are as a customer, identify what the vendor OEM's responsibility are as a manufacturer. Um, all the way from you know who's patching it to who's liable if there's a breach, whether it's you know your side or their side. Um, how they may access the device is always big. Um, you know a lot of times there's there's good ways and bad ways to 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 access devices remotely. Uh, it's obviously you know really helpful for certain support situations, uh, but it can also be a huge attack vector that that can cause everybody to have a bad day. So. We we'll want to make sure everybody's in agreement on how that remote access is going to be provided, how it's going to be secured, uh, logged, and et cetera. So make sure that gets into the contract discussions. Uh, it shouldn't be just about um, support in a you know break fix situation or scenario. It really needs to be about security as well. Um, and then last but not least, you know what can you do to monitor the device, whether it's installing agents, it's uh, using existing tools in, within the hospital. Um, maybe the vendor has an agent. Uh, we've seen cases where vendors do like to have telemetry uh, off the devices that are installed in the hospital, but that can obviously cause issues when that data is going places that the hospital doesn't expect it. So um, again, be sure to have those conversations, start asking those questions um, while you're at the bargaining table uh, before that contract sign. And then uh, ultimately you're left with, okay, we have this device now, what are we gonna do? Oh, uh, it's all our responsibility. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's that's kind of how, some of the, the highlights that we see when discussing procurement with, with vendors, um, but I'll let Jeremy kind of walk you through how a simile uh, can equip you to, to better address risk. Um, using the ProSecure tool. Great, thanks, Greg. Um, 
So, so as, uh, as, he, as Greg mentioned, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about our post-secure product, which is the way that, that we really uh, manage procurement risk. And, and, and this is a platform that we provide to our customer base. Um, so this is our product that really tries to solve that problem for an organization. So what we do, we, we basically take the MDS2 and SBOM forms that Greg was talking about. We gather them. Uh, from the manufacturers ourselves, rather than, you know, we don't rely on the, the HDO customer to, to do that. Um, and then we evaluate those in the context of whatever that specific device does. Uh, try to understand, you know, whatever mitigations might be in place for those devices, what the options are, whether there are factors that either could, you know, exacerbate a potential risk or, or reduce that risk. Um, you know, we really have invested a lot of time on not just you know, taking the forms and digitizing them, but really putting a lot of thought into how each of the answers in that form uh, affects uh, the the security capabilities and the risk, uh, you know, for different types of devices. But, you know, we don't really stop there. Um, that's really only the beginning because really, you know, our uh, one of the core data sets here is that we augment all of the MDS2 information from the manufacturer with our real world data um, from devices in the field um, from uh, health systems that are uh, using our assimily insight product for um, you know iomt risk remediation uh, and operations um, so we're taking the data from these devices that we're actually seeing in customer environments we aggregate uh, crowdsource and then we all anonymize all of the data so that it's not relevant to any individual customer um, but but we're basically taking all the information about what the risk what the real world risk is for all of these devices as they exist in real world environments and in really that's invaluable because there's really no substitute for how that for for information about how a device is really performing in the field uh, we give you that detailed device information about how it behaves uh, on the network, as well as provide uh, a risk analysis that tries to quantify that risk on a one to 10 scale, uh, and then allows you to compare that risk to other devices that you might be purchase considering purchasing. And then finally, we give you these mitigation recommendations um, for the risks that we typically see on these devices, as well as provide a lot of configuration guidance about how you could configure the device for to, to have less risk. And these data are used for a couple kind of core use cases. First, um, the pre-procurement risk assessment, um, where HDOs are really trying to figure out, okay, I want to, I need to buy you know, a, a new device model of a particular device type, what's the most secure model that I can buy? But then also, we use the data to provide, to perform device hardening uh, and providing configuration guidance for devices that are, you know, currently standalone. So devices that have been purchased, um, but they're not actually connected to the network yet. Um, and this is really, uh, you know, this configuration guidance, both pre-procurement as well as post-procurement, is really important because uh, the changes in the configuration of an individual device really can make a huge difference in the risk of that device. And what we do with ProSecure is we give you information about what the highest uh, and lowest observed risk configurations for a particular device is that we've actually seen in the real world HDO environment. And on the right, you can see kind of how that looks. Um, you can see it's the same device configured in very different ways, really can have a dramatically different risk. And it's very hard to understand this, you know, be, unless you you really, uh, you know, can pop open the hood like you can uh, with uh, our ProSecure product and, and really show you what's running underneath. Um, so, so configuration, it, it really, really matters. Um, and this is kind of how, you know, it looks, um, you can see a dashboard where you can basically request a report for any device that you're considering purchasing. And then we'll, you know, that report gets generated for you. Then you can also go and customize that report. So if there's a particular, um, if there is a particular device um, that you know you're going to configure in a specific way, you know you're going to turn off some functionality, you can go and say, okay, I know I'm going to do this. I'm mean, you're able to kind of configure it inside of the platform uh, and then use that to, uh, to, to show you 
uh, to model the to remodel the risk, right? So if you make some configuration change, how does that risk actually change in the real world? Um, and then you know, Greg's gonna talk a bit about the a real world example of this. Yeah, so I think this is a this is a great example that reflects um, what is, what we see in a lot of places. I, I haven't been into a HDO where they haven't had Windows XP on on a medical device. Uh, and there hasn't been some kind of initiative to replace Windows XP. Uh, basically, you know, it, it's it's a typical approach. Hey, we've got these older OSs that we can't patch. Let's upgrade them. Uh, unfortunately, that that sometimes sends us down a path of getting quotes and looking at new equipment. And this was an example where we had a CT, uh, obviously not a cheap device, um, running on Windows XP. So also a, a huge risk. You know, we can't patch it presents risk to the organization and it's a key function. So uh, kind of the perfect storm, if you will. And so we we say, okay, we're gonna get a quote for a new device. And in that process, we look at the ProSecure report and actually find out that this new device is running Windows 7. So we're, we're still not on a supportable OS, so strike one. And then we look at the actual risk and find out that in its form, in the in that we, that assembly has been able to compile based on the, the customer data they have, the Windows XP device is actually more secure because if you harden it and you disable the, the services that are at risk for XP, you reduce the threat surface lower than that of the Windows 7 machine. So this case, you know, is very counterintuitive. Uh, obviously, you think you're going to upgrade, you're going to get a safer device. You go from Windows XP to Windows 7, it should be safer. Um, turns out, uh, Windows 7 has a huge threat surface too, and the way this particular device was configured, uh, it was actually going to be worse than than what the organization already had. So, this represented a huge savings for them. Um, you know, essentially paid pays for the whole program in in one in one uh, capital you know purchase uh, avoidance, um, but at the same time really showed and kind of opened the conversation beyond just Windows XP replacement. Uh, again, you know, there's a lot more to these devices than just the operating system. Jeremy mentioned the configuration. You know, until you really look at the data and see what you can do to to harden these devices, um, you know, you 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 kind of have a lot have to take things for granted. And so that that information in this case w was worth seventy thousand dollars. You know, uh, by being able to understand what the real risk risk was um, to the organization. So. How do, how do we work together to, to solve this problem? You know, basically, you know, we mentioned earlier, there's there's a huge push, uh, regulatory requirements, cybersecurity requirements to do assessments. Uh, obviously, organizations want to save money, so procurement is a is you know is is usually focused about you know the cost, um, but we can come in and, and really help you understand the risk of the device. Look at both cost savings and risk savings. Uh, in these situations, and you know, I'll mention that sometimes it's not as uh, it's not super straightforward. You know, if you have the right right people, they you know what you're buying, you can you know say, hey, you know, I want to report for this model. ProSecure is a great tool um, to do that. If you want to just say, hey, we're considering these devices, can you kind of show us what risk looks for maybe a family of devices? Um, we can we can get involved. We can we can break down both the support cost. Uh, what support looks like, what security looks like, what configuration hardening looks like for each of those devices, and, and ultimately help you um, bring them in and secure them uh, once you once you have made the decision, make the actual configuration changes of the device based on the uh, assembly recommendations. Work with your IT team um, to to basically provide the the safest insulation of that that device as, as possible. So. So, I'm, so on the um, you know on this on the lastly about on the medic on the maximizing investment in your in your devices, I'm going to talk about why you should be tracking utilization and then using that for capital planning. So first, let's sort of take, walk through a scenario. So a nursing leader you know might say that they don't have um, enough infusion pumps and they're asking to purchase more. Now you know in a lot of situations right now, HDOs might not know whether these devices are really needed, right? Are they are they running out of infusion pumps because they actually don't have enough? Or are there infusion pumps sitting in another unit that aren't actually being utilized and they could just be reallocated? 
or are there some that are like you know infusion pumps that just haven't been seen for for weeks and might be in a cabinet somewhere that that no one knows about in reality a lot of hdos right now don't have that kind of org-wide view of all of their assets where they are where they're being used and this is leads to you know inefficient capital allocations and often buying more than you really need. At a simile, you know, we provide both hour by hour um, as well as day by day utilization calculations, and that can be useful for a number of purposes, you know, from capital equipment planning to optimization. And it can also be useful for, you know, even for security, right? Like if you notice a device that's active at a time which didn't really make any sense for it to be active, like when the device is closed, it could actually mean something suspicious is going on. So that ability to, you know, provide, you know, multiple lenses into utilization, show you where the device is. We also track where, you know, physically where it is in the organization by, by mapping, you know, where it is on the network. Um, it really allows you to, to do this planning in a, in a much more intelligent way. So utilization, um, you know, we, there are a couple different measurements that we use, and I think these are useful in, you know, a couple different ways for different purposes. So first there's like raw utilization, right? There's, there's just the, you know, over the last day, how many hours, uh, or if you're doing it based on a, a particular window, like a, you know, a, a standard eight hour day, um, you know, what does it mean? How many hours of that eight hours was it being used? Um, you know, it's a simple ratio. And this is really useful for like optimizing, you know, scheduling of devices, you know, between different time periods, you know, maintenance windows, where are these devices being less used? Like if you need something that's specifically, you know, time of day related, that's very, very useful. Um, but it's also not necessarily the most useful measurement from a real capital planning perspective, because when you're thinking about devices, you really also have to think about, you know, you can't just think about the average, you need to think about what the maximum is, right? Because, you know, even if there are certain times of the day where these devices are really underutilized, um, if you can't really control, if you can't spread things out, you still need the ability to accommodate more of, the, of a peak type usage. So we also track the what we call the percentage of devices that are used. So this is basically like, you know, if you're tracking it over a day, this is like how many devices were being used at all over that day, right? Even if they were only used for an hour of the day. Um, so that can really help show you if you have actual misallocation issues, right? Like if there's regularly in a given day, if there's, you know, 20, 30 plus percent of devices that never get shut on, turned on and used, um, you know, that's a powerful indication um, that there might be some misallocation issues um, and you might have, you might be over, over provisioned. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, there's a better way to do this, right? If, it, if, an, if a, you know, if you're flying blind normally, you can really use, um, a, you know, a simile, which is our insight product that provides this functionality, you know, have, get a full picture, notice that these devices have uh, become unbalanced and then go and use that knowledge to rebalance them and then avoid getting, you know, procuring more devices um, than you actually need. Um, so, you know, this is something that we, you know, we see a lot of organizations starting to adopt, um, you know, a lot, you know, a lot more rigorous sort of more, you know, uh, technical software driven ways of, of doing procurement, of doing capacity planning, um, and, and this is all, you know, we think is a very positive goal um, and we are, you know, really glad to have been able to present um, some information about how you can maximize the investment using these software platforms. Um, so I'd like to thank you. Um, we're going to take questions um, now, so feel free to ask them in, uh, in the appropriate place in the platform. But if you have any other you know, questions that you'd like to ask to either of us directly, our emails are here. So if you want to learn about Assimile, if you want to learn about Renovo, or if you just have a question about anything we talked about today, please do uh, reach out to us. We'd be really happy to hear from you all. Thank you, Jeremy and Greg, for all of this valuable information. As a reminder to the audience, if you have a question, please use the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We do have a few questions that have come in already, so we'll start with those. We have noticed that 
we often have MDS2 forms that don't seem to exactly match the details of the devices in our environment. What is the best way to handle this issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and that's actually something that we noticed too, right? It's, and it's actually, it's to be honest, it's a difficult technical challenge. And it's actually a technical challenge that we've, we've worked on ourselves, right? In many, because in many cases, the, the, what the manufacturer puts in the MDS2 is often vague, or it's not clear which versions it actually applies to. Um, and it's often not clear what version you even have, right? Depending on the device or the device type. Um, so that that's something that that really that's work that has been done, you know, in software platforms like ours, right? You actually can go in um, and you can, you know, get you can actually see the differences between different versions. You can understand um, which what what the difference is. And then if you have, um, you know, a product like a Simile Insight, we actually automatically will go and look on the network fingerprint the device, understand what version it is, and then match it with the right MDS2. Um, so it does take a lot of, you know, there's, it's quite detail oriented. I don't know how, I don't know how easy it would be to do on your own, but it is a, it is a feature that um, is, you know, one thing that we, you know, we think that, that Assimilies platform is pretty good at. Yeah, I can say I've done it the hard way uh, manually in the past, and it's tedious. So you you, know, you can always go out and ask the questions yourself, fill out your own forms. Um, one of the advantages to assembly is if you do notice those discrepancies and maybe the MDS2 isn't accurate, you can always adjust the adjust the questions within the software, and then that gets reflected back into the overall security posture as well. Um, so there's different ways to handle it. Some are obviously easier than others, but good question. All right, our next question is, many of my existing vendors already provide a view of utilization across their deployed devices. So why would I need another solution to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you that those platforms aren't useful because I think that they are, right? And I think that, they, you know, if you don't have a, another platform, you absolutely can and should. Uh, be using those those platforms to track utilization if that's if that's a, a feature that's offered. You know, I think the benefit with a product of, of you know a a solution like ours is that you can really understand you can really get that the same measurements standardized across many different device types and many different vendors. Right, when you're dealing with individual vendors, you're going to have to use you know obviously you're going to have to use each of their individual dashboards. The way that they track might not be standardized, um, and, and so it can be hard to really get a, a consistent process that you put into place for all your for all your devices. Um, and then, secondly, you know these platforms, you know a platform like ours, you know has role-based access control, and if you want, you know you can give people access to the utilization information without giving them access to anything else. Um, you know, in some of these vendors platforms, you you really can't give access to the platform without giving access to some of the PHI that's used uh, in the in the system itself. Um, and our platform, we don't actually, we, we know which devices are transmitting and receiving PHI, but we'd never store any PHI. So there's no real liability to potentially giving anyone access to PHI because we don't see it um, and we don't, or, and we don't, we don't store it. Um, so, so those are some of the some of the reasons why you know a platform like ours you know might be better than than trying to roll your own process with what vendors give you. All right, our next question is: Are you using the data in ProSecure for other things than procure, procurement risk assessments? Yes, uh, we definitely are. You know, in a, you know the MDS2 and, and some and the information that we gather uh, and aggregate from our customer base is really the core of of our of our entire software platform. Um, so our flagship product uh, called Assimily Insight also uses uh, all of those data. Um, and, and the way that Assimily Insight uses the data are a bit is a bit different, right? I mean, it, it's a, it's more uh, an operations platform, not for not not for pre procurement. It's during operations. Um, but all the answers in that, um, in, in, the, in those forms, um, you know, it helps us model, okay, what are the remediations that you could in theory apply? What are the mitigations that you could apply to a device? And it helps us score a device's vulnerabilities because, uh, you know, things that have been 
implemented on the device side that could mitigate a threat might mean that a very high severity vulnerability might be a little bit less severe um, if we apply what we understand about the device's internal capabilities that we're able to gather from you know MDS2s or SBOM forms. Um, so that's you know we are we are incorporating that information throughout our entire platform. Our next question is with a staffing shortage already present in the general biomed industry. What might you suggest as a plan of action to address the additional need to build a specialized team of CE, IS technician analysts? Yeah. Um, so I think that it's important to try to understand to try to get a, a a clear ownership. I don't know. I don't think it necessarily has to be a dedicated team. I think you can actually pull in resources from across the organization. Sometimes the dedicated team really does make sense depending on the volume of work. But um, you know, as long as you have clear lines of responsibility, clear understanding of who's responsible for which parts of the process and where exactly that's shared between the different groups, um, you can use you can often you know make do um, that way. The one thing that I would really caution against is trying to is having you know, vague lines of responsibility or, or sort of unclear shared, shared, you know, pieces of responsibility. It's fine to have different parts of the process that different people are uh, responsible for. That's, that's really unavoidable. But when, when multiple people feel like they own the same thing, I think many of us have experienced this in the end, you, you know, no one ends up owning it and it doesn't get done. Greg, do you have any uh, yep. other insights that you want to share? Yeah, I mean, that, it's a great question because this is really, you know, same question we had to solve our, for ourselves, both internally and, you know, externally to our customers. And um, the Insight platform was really the tool that helped us kind of address some of that need because, you know, I was looking at it, you know, if, if, you, if you just look at all the risk out there, all the CVEs, all of the problems, you know, you have thousands of things to do and there's so much noise. And we were looking for a tool that really cut to the chase and put the right information, the right insight in the hands of, you know, I, I don't want to say typical staff, but staff that doesn't need to be a pen tester, doesn't need to understand reverse malware engineering to really get, hey, this CVE means this, here's the recommendation, here's how we solve it, let's move on. And, you know, the, it doesn't require, uh, you know, tons uh, of, security specialization to really understand that. And so for us, it gave us kind of the ability to empower our existing staff with a tool that they could use and understand without, you know, again, spending hours trying to reverse engineer one specific CVE just for one product. Um, so that allowed us to, to really become more actionable uh, within our staff. And then of course, we kind of have a, the, the advantage of economies of scale. So we do have organizations where they don't have the staff inside that uh, maybe just to kind of manage things. They you know they have the boots on the ground, but they just want to provide oversight. And so we do provide just a level, uh, you know, a lightweight level of uh, management to say, you know, here's kind of what the Insight platform is telling us needs to happen. Here's what your staff can do. Uh, if we need to come in, we can come in, or we can contact the vendors. Um, again, kind of kind of helping people on this journey. Uh, because I think the first reaction is, wow, we need a team of people to address this. Well, um, there are resources needed to address this. There's no doubt. Uh, but I think you have to be smart about how you do it because um, there's a, everybody's competing for security resources in this, in not just in healthcare, but across, across every industry. Um, so I, I, I recommend, you know, kind of building up what you have, empowering them with the best tools, and then, you know, uh, augmenting, you know, any gaps that you have left. Thank you again, Jeremy and Greg, for your time today and for a great presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit assembly.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the end of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your CE credit from the ACI and you'll be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. 
We'll be back next week with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.